Today on Straight Talk Africa, Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza's decision to run for a third term has triggered massive protests and a failed coup. As a result, many Burundians are seeking sanctuary in neighboring countries. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, May 27th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Maria Madiello, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the political crisis in Burundi and its regional implications. And wow, our social media followers had a lot to say about the current situation. Coming up later, we'll reveal some of the thoughts you shared via emails, Twitter, and Facebook comments. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, opponents accused the Burundian president of violating the Arusha Accord, which mandated a two-term limit and a deal that ended the civil war in the country. The government has failed to end the protests or ease tensions in Bujumbura, the capital. We have two reports, but first, here is my colleague, Paul Sisko. President Pierre Kurunziza maintains a constitutional court ruling allows him to serve another term because he was first chosen by parliament and not elected by popular vote. In line with good governance, I respect the ruling of the constitutional court in its entirety, respect it, and wish to inform national and international opinion that if re-elected, this will be the final term, again, as provided in the court's ruling. Opponents say the court is biased, and his re-election bid violates the Arusha Peace Accord that ended the Civil War in 2005. Since the ruling, protests have grown more violent. The president calls the protests a revolt. At least 20 people have died, and demonstrators remain very angry. We can't be scared of death. This president wants to rule us, and he's killing us. We must fight for our dignity. We must fight for Arusha Accord till the end. What we are against is the third term, and all the killings by the police. Politicians against the third term are being killed like dogs. Thousands in Burundi's capital, Bujumbura, attended the funeral of murdered opposition leader Zedi Faruzi, killed by unidentified gunmen on Saturday. The UN, European Union, the US, and the African Union are calling on all parties to stop the violence, emphasizing that authorities must also respect the freedoms of expression and assembly. Many citizens fear a return to civil war and increased ethnic violence. As the protests and unrest continue, over 100,000 people have fled the country. The election that would likely give President Kurunziza another five years in power is set for June 26th. Parliamentary and local council polls delayed due to the violence are set for June 5th. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now we move to the humanitarian side of the story, where cholera has killed dozens and infected some 3,000 Burundian refugees in Tanzania. My colleague, Esther Gizuyu Ewart, has more. Burundi refugees who fled to Tanzania after fleeing political turmoil at home now face an outbreak of cholera. In a stadium near Lake Tanganyika, the deadly disease is spreading fast. In the past few weeks, it has killed at least 33 people in the area. The United Nations reports that over 3,000 more have been infected with cholera in the country, and there is fear of a growing humanitarian crisis. The epidemic is still worsening to date. Some 3,000 cases have been reported. Numbers are increasing at a rate of three to 400 people per day, new cases, particularly in Kagunga and nearby areas. Burundi President Perrin Kruziza's decision to run for a third term last month has sparked protests and a failed coup. As a result, refugees, many from the Tutsi minority, have fled to neighboring countries. The United Nations estimates that 100,000 Burundians have already fled the country and the exodus could double in the coming months. Esther Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. Thanks, Esther, for that report. And now joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests, Reverend Aniedi Okule, 
Executive Director of the Africa Faith and Justice Network, a non-profit organization that educates and advocates for transformation of U.S. policies toward Africa. And John Manirakiza, a member of the Burundian diaspora in Washington, D.C. Well, gentlemen, I have to say again that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you again on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks Shaka. for having me. You're most welcome. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is 1. But before we begin today's discussion, let's get an update on what's happening on the ground. And for that, I'm joined by my colleague, Edward Ruema, of the Voice of America's Central Africa Service, who joins us via telephone link up from the capital, Bujumbura. Good evening, Edward. Good evening, uh, Ndugu Shakasali. How are you doing? How is Washington? I am hugely terrific. And how is Bujumbura? Bujumbura is uh, a little bit calmer today, uh, despite uh, a few pockets of uh, shooting here and there uh, from different suburbs of the town. But otherwise, uh, it looks a little bit calmer now. Which part of the city do you call home these days, uh, Eddie? Well, uh, I call home the southern part of Bujumbura, uh, so that's uh, specifically where I'm at. Now, the last time I was in Bujumbura, the epicenter of problems in that country were in places like uh, Kamenge, Chibitoke, and Musaga. Uh, well, right now, I wouldn't say that uh, Kamenge is one of the epicenters of trouble because right now uh, it's considered uh, a neighborhood which is a stronghold uh, to, to the CNDD, FDD uh, ruling party. But, however, uh, suburbs and districts like uh, Kibitoke and Musaga have been uh, the epicenter of uh, uh, the ongoing protests and uh, demonstrations here in the capital of Bujumbura. Have you been able to move out of the capital, Eddie? Well, uh, we haven't been able to move out of the country because uh, most of the demonstrations are concentrated here in the capital, Bujumbura. We've heard of uh, other uh, demonstrations in other provinces, uh, but we haven't been able to go there. But we have strangers on the ground that uh, keep us informed on what is happening in those other parts of the country. But uh, most of the demonstrations are concentrated here in the capital, Bujumbura. Eddie, what about uh, the talks, uh, the talks between the government and opposition parties? Uh, can you give us also an update of that? Because the last time I checked, uh, it looked like uh, the opposition had actually withdrawn from talking to the government. That is very true, Shaka. Yes, the opposition announced they are withdrawing from the negotiations that were being mediated by the UN office here uh, in Bujumbura, headed by uh, the UN Special Envoy uh, Said Junid. But after the death of uh, op opposition leader uh, uh, Ferruz, uh, who led a party called uh, uh, an opposition party here in the capital, Bujumbura, uh, the opposition announced that they were going to terminate all, all, all negotiations they were having with government. But yesterday, uh, I was able to speak to uh, one of the leading human rights defenders, uh, Pierre Clev and Bonima, who told me that as long as the government was ready to negotiate in good faith, they are willing to, to, to come back uh, to the table and, and negotiate. However, the, the recent reports I'm getting right now, because there was a, a meeting in the, uh, at the United Nations headquarters in New York, and it looks like the UN is uh, trying to leave all the negotiations and, and, uh, uh, to the East African community leaders to handle that. So that is what is happening right now. That's the update we are getting. But unfortunately, we are not able to, to confirm whether the Burundian president, uh, Pierre Nkurunziza, is going to be attending uh, the heads of state summit. Uh, when I spoke today with his uh, communications advisor, uh, he said able to confirm or deny whether the president is going to be part of the, uh, of the meeting, but he said Burundi is going to be represented at the talk. And where are the talks going to be held? Are they still going to be held again in Dar es Salaam, the harbor of peace in Tanzania? 
Well, uh, the information reaching us right now all indicate that the, the talks were called by the Tanzanian president, Jakaya Kikwete, who also happens to be the chairman of the East African community. So basically, uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to be taking place in Dar es Salaam. That's very true. Eddie, talk to us about the issue of elections that uh, have been sort of partially postponed. Uh, are they continuing? Uh, is the government still adamant to hold parliamentary elections sometime next week? Uh, in fact, what is happening here in Bujumbura as opposition members, uh, civil societies are uh, on the streets demonstrating against the decision by President Pierre Nkurunziza to run again for a third term. The ruling party is busy campaigning uh, outside the capital Bujumbura in different provinces, and uh, they are determined to go ahead with the parliamentary elections that were postponed to uh, June 5th. Uh, in fact, right now, because of the pressure from the international community to cut all the funding they had uh, set aside to support the Burundian electoral process, now the government is saying, is arguing its population, it's calling it uh, arguing uh, patriot Burundians to come out and support the electoral process so it, could, it, it can go ahead and take place uh, this coming June Shaka. Now, Eddie, when we talk about uh, the opposition, do you have any evidence, for example, to suggest that uh, the opposition indeed uh, is speaking with one voice, or are there some splits? Are there some, some political parties uh, which are doing business with the government? Uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's very uncommon here in Bujumbura to find an opposition party that is not split. Most of the parties here, be the Fraudable Party, be uh, the Prona Party, uh, be other small parties, are all split. They are parties that uh, are aligned to the government or are working with the government. And uh, there are also other parties that split that are uh, not uh, recognized by, 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 by the current government. So uh, when you say that uh, if the opposition can speak with one voice, I would say uh, it's very, very difficult to, 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 to confirm. Because uh, what we see on the ground, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, uh, divided. Now, if uh, the government uh, goes ahead and holds the election, have you seen uh, any evidence to suggest that uh, there may in fact be some external observers? Well, right now, uh, given the fact that uh, all reports coming out of the international community indicate or uh, don't support uh, the current uh, move by the government to go ahead with the elections, there's a likelihood that we will not see so many uh, countries sending in electoral observers to come and observe these elections which uh, most of the international community are considering illegal, which the international community is calling for to, uh, to, or is urging to have them push, push for, for, for some time so that the opposition can also prepare themselves to go ahead with elections and campaigns. Now, given that uh, the parties, of course, as you say, are split across the board, and I'm sure you have been able to uh, move around the capital of Bujumbura and talked with a lot of people, uh, what sense do you get when you talk to some of these people? Do you get some people who are supportive of elections and those, of course, uh, who say, no way? You will definitely get uh, mixed feelings uh, when you speak to uh, individuals here in the capital of Bujumbura. But one thing I would tell you that uh, Bujumbura is, uh, is known to, 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 to be uh, uh, against the current uh, ruling government. And uh, most of the people here, uh, they will tell you that uh, they're not ready yet to go into an election until uh, the current president stands down and probably his party uh, chooses another person to, to, to be the flag bearer of the of the. Uh, of the uh, of the ruling party. But on the other side, uh, you will also hear people who are telling you that uh, um, Kuruziza is legitimately allowed to stand again for, for another term, uh, since they say that uh, the current constitution says that uh, he's supposed to be voted twice uh, through uh, universal suffrage. Now, do Eddie, talk to us about uh, your job. How is it like? Uh to work downtown Bujumbura. Do you run into a lot of problems? Well, uh, we haven't uh, 
gotten into any problems, but there is always a uh, threat from the police because uh, most of the time they don't want us to take pictures of them, either shooting those live bullets, uh, shooting uh, tear gases to the populations. So most of the time there is just threat, uh, them telling us not to follow them wherever they are going. But besides that, uh, besides the neighborhoods where the, uh, the, 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 prote the protests are going on, the other side of the city is a little bit calmer. Uh, but again, you will see uh, a huge presence of police, a huge presence of army. Most of the roads uh, have been blocked. So uh, commuting within Bujumbura is a little bit harder for, for somebody who is used to, to a very vibrant and uh, entertaining Bujumbura. Well, I'm afraid uh, time happens not to be our best ally. And for that, uh, we'll have to stop right there. I'd like to thank Eddie Wema of Voice of America Central Africa Service for sharing his perspective with us. He joined us from the capital, Bujumbura. Take care of yourself, Eddie. Now we'll pause for a short break, and we would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter, and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword, Straight Talk Africa, Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away. Let's take a quick look at a timeline of Burundi's political instability. On June 2014, President Pierre Nkurunziza hints that he might seek a third term, despite opposition complaints that this would be unconstitutional. On October 2014, Burundian opposition leader Leonce Gendakumana is sentenced to a year in prison for slander. He calls it a political trial ahead of the 2015 election. In January of this year, the ruling party Senator Richard Nimbashi issues a press release opposing Kurunziza's third term, and he was immediately expelled from the party, the Senate, and his position at the Land Commission. In February, the National Intelligence Service issues a memo warning President Kurunziza against an attempt to seek a third term. On March 3rd, increased social discontent, including a general strike over the high cost of living, deepens political tensions over President Kurunziza's potential third term. On March 14, the CNDD FDD Council of Elders, the highest body of the party, met in the presence of President Kurunziza and overwhelmingly rejected his third term bid. Between March 21st and March 23rd, the Electoral Commission reopens voter registration. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. If you were to talk to us from the deepest bitter part of the bottom of your heart and soul, can you pledge to the Ghanaian people that under no circumstances during your presidential tenure are you ever going to abuse the Ghanaian constitution and be tempted, for example, uh, to engage in these uh, constitutional political shifting goalposts? Shaka, let me tell you, you are six months too late. <laughs> I swore that oath to the people of Ghana when I was sworn into office on the 7th of January this year. And I always remind myself of the very secret obligation and vows that I've undertaken and made. Yes, uh, this is something that I cannot ignore. 
constitution guides us. And if you want to build a better Ghana, if you want to leave a legacy, the constitution is the last thing that one should attempt to ignore or circumvent. There are a lot of your colleagues uh, uh, when it is about time to end uh, their terms. Basically what they do is uh, uh, do what some characterizers uh, engage in, in the shifting of political constitutional goalposts. Is that something that you could even remotely think about? Our constitution forbids it. Our people won't allow it. And I don't want it. So the answer is no. That was the late Ghanaian President Professor John Evans Atta Mills, followed by Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sarif. They both categorically emphasized the importance of upholding, respecting, and defending their country's constitutions. Welcome back. And today, of course, uh, we are talking about the political crisis in Burundi and its regional implications. Our two distinguished guests are Reverend Aniedi Okule, Executive Director of the Africa Faith and Justice Network, a non-profit organization that educates and advocates for transformation of U.S. policies toward Africa, and John Mani Rakiza, a member of the Burundian Diaspora in Washington, D.C. Well, gentlemen, of course, uh, you are welcome again on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Your reaction, uh, Reverend, uh, you just listened to two important African leaders. Unfortunately, uh, Professor John Evans Atamils left us uh, several years back, uh, basically returning back to his creator. But he was adamant about, um, really, this business of changing constitutions mm -hmm. so as to personally or politically benefit him. Yeah, I like the word he used. He said, he used the word sacred obligation. Mm -hmm. And from my profession, my standpoint, that is very weighty. Sacred. Yeah, very sacred. He used the word sacred obligation. And so uh, what many presidents don't realize, African presidents, that when they raise their hand and swear to uphold the constitution of the country and protect the people, they are making a sacred oath. Mm, mm, mm. You know? And so to try to wangle around that is striking fundamentally at the core of what that office is. So for somebody to try to change, it's like me. I said, OK, I'll try and rewrite the scripture so that I can have my own way, with, uh, the way I want. Mm. That's, that's what the, the constitution of the country is, in a way, sacred. Except when the people decide on their own accord to say, OK, these things are, don't work as we thought. We change it, you know? But for some, an individual to begin to manipulate that sacred obligation entrusted to him by the people, mm -hmm. it's really a, a breach of trust of the people. But some of these uh, people or some of these uh, rulers, when they change constitutions, they actually claim that they are doing it because they are succumbing to the pressure of the people. I would say, show me one. <laughs> oh, there will be very no, many no, people because... No, I mean, they say that, okay. I mean, that's the rhetoric we hear. <laughs> but, you know, do they really? They, they don't. I mean, okay, let's take the case in point here. You know, um, in Burundi, we are talking about the people are up in arms. You, you, uh, you know, they run down... The, the bishops, the Catholic bishops, representing a vast majority of the people in the country, come together and said, don't do it. Mm. You know, even people within the same party say, don't do it. And the person still try and wangle around. So that's what I'm saying. Show me somebody who truly, truly is succumbing to the will of the people. There is none. What about you, John? You are a Murundi. Yes, sir. Nah, a, a patriotic Murundi. Murundi. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah uh, in addition to what Reverend just uh, said about uh, the sacred nature of, of this obligation, uh, Sharon Johnson talked about the people don't want it. And remember, these documents, most of the time, you can see all the documents. The U.S. Constitution starts with, we the people. Yes. And even in Burundi, the Constitution say we the Burundian people, according to the Arusha Accord, we are deciding such and such and such article of the Constitution. That's where they established the limit, uh, term limit. So if you want to go against the sacred um, uh, uh, vow, mm. and you're also going against the people's wishes, and, 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 and if you hear people say, it's just a few people who are just doing this. But this is a national movement, although a few people just are in Bujumbura, maybe. But places like uh, Bujumbura, Rirar, Bururi, Mwaro, uh, Bubanza, <coughs> people are doing the same away from media. And remember that the government has decided to shut down all the media, destroy the media so that the news doesn't go out. But, and I hear from what the people are saying that this is a question of that sacred agreement. It's a contract they made between the people and their leaders that they are going to hold right to the Constitution. And that's why it, it's, it's very sad to see what is happening in Burundi. Because we had so much hope within that framework of Arusha that says, now, from now on, the people are going to live together in peace, in a very inclusive way, and having a dialogue when they have problems. And now we have a specter of a civil war, which is really heartbreaking. Now, June, let's be very clear here. I have seen the Burundian constitution. I have also uh, seen a decision made by uh, uh, the judges of uh, the Constitutional Court. Uh, there were seven, but it is six who actually unanimously sided with uh, incumbent President uh, Nkurunziza. Mm -hmm. Under no circumstances, frankly, would you convince me that uh, Nkurunziza here is trying to shift the constitutional political goalposts. In fact, what he's probably doing is violating the spirit and the letter, the letter of the Arusha Accord of 2000. Yes, but remember... But not the Constitution. They are not changing the Constitution. No, the Accord, Arusha Accord actually is very specific in its second protocol where they talk about elections. They say, and I think it's uh, Article 10 or, or uh, 11, 9 or 10, they say this is in 2000, they agree that the first post-transition uh, election, the mm -hmm. first president of the post-transition election mm -hmm. will not be elected directly. Mm -hmm. He will be elected by Congress and the Senate uh, uh, together combined by two-thirds. Is, so that, this, is that the Constitution or the, the Arusha Arusha Accord? Accord? That's the Arusha Accord. And then and the Constitution this Accord, says this. Yes. The Constitution says this. According to the Arusha Accord, this is the preamble. It's like the U.S. Constitution says, we, the people, mm -hmm. are giving the legislator this right. So it's the people who decided that the Constitution is, is, is have to be from Arusha. Yes, but let's face it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not a lawyer. I am not uh, certainly a land friend. Uh, I am not a judge. Uh, I know, in fact, am I a judge of the Burundi uh, constitutional court. Mm -hmm. The Burundi constitutional court has spoken. Under duress. Whether, well, we don't know. We don't know because if you say under duress, maybe we should look across the world. Because the last time I checked, in the year 2000, we had a problem here. For only the 2000, I'm sure you have heard about it. Did any judge, you run, had, you did had, any, any judge run and become a refugee? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We did have George W. Bush winning uh, the election, election being disputed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the dispute was in Florida, where his own brother, Jeb Bush, mm -hmm. was governor. I did not hear people talk about Jeb Bush being the brother of George W. Bush. If it was in Africa, they would be saying, you know what? This is what happened. After all, his brother is the governor of Florida. Mm -hmm. George W. Bush was not elected 
president of the United States in his first term. He was appointed by the Supreme Court of the United States of America, five to four verdict. And the five members who voted for him, when you look at their history, they had been appointed by Republican presidents. People grumbled here and what have you, but life went on. So let's be honest. You may not agree with the decision made by the Burundian Constitutional Court, but since the court has spoken, you may have to accept it. Correct? Well, according to the people, they are willing to just go back to uh, where they started, which is the Arusha uh, Code, where they agree, two-term we'll, limits. We'll come back to that, because let's face it, uh, if you look at the Arusha Accord and compare it with the Burundi Constitution, surely the Burundi Constitution must be the supreme law of the land, not the Arusha Accord, which was, by the way, ratified in 2005. Well, time happens not to be our best ally, really. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Maria Majero. Take it away, Maria. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week. Enik Noah Munsapa from Lusaka in Zambia writes, Political leaders in staying in power too long are slowly killing Africa. Let's give room to others who may come in with fresh thinking and great ideas. I wonder what people are thinking, especially political leaders, when they give speeches about Africa Freedom Day. Africa is not yet liberated. Burundian President Pierre Nkurunziza is a selfish leader. Let him step down before we see genocide, like in Rwanda. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizu Ewat. And welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Despite the failed coup attempt against Burundi's President Piam Kurunziza, protesters continue to demonstrate against what they call an illegal bid for a third term. They define Kurunziza's ban on demonstrations and are vowing to continue to take to the streets to press the president to drop his plan to run for re-election next month. This leads us to our question of the week asking, how do you feel about Burundian's president's plan to run for a third term? Well, thanks everyone for using all our social media platform to communicate to us. Let's begin with a comment from Paul Ebere Chuku in Lagos, Nigeria, who posted this comment on our wall. What is the matter with African leaders perpetuating themselves in power? This is exactly the ban of African development. Burundians are not slaves to Nkurunziza, for God's sake. How can he arm twist, how can he arm twist the country's constitutional court for his selfish interest? I'm sorry for Africa. Well, a reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA Burundi Instability. And if you haven't yet, please follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Let's go to a tweet now from Jackson uh, Peter of uh, Cape Town in South Africa, who writes, Article 96, the president of the republic is elected by universal direct suffrage for a mandate of five years renewable one time. Well, Article 96 of the Burundian Constitution seems to be up for interpretation in regards to presidential term limits. 
with the CNDD FDD ruling party arguing that the first term should not be taken into account since that election was by the National Assembly. Well, let's take a look at another tweet, this time from Patrick Sembatia of Makerere in Kampala, Uganda. He says, it really hurts that such presidents still exist in this 21st century. If people are tired, listen to them, and if you really love your people. Shaka, and guess, uh, very, very interesting comments. Your very, take on those. Very interesting indeed, Mariam, as you say. Well, let me give it to... Uh the Reverend himself. Yeah, let, let me return to the analogy you made between uh, Florida and what's happening to the, You know, the, the president, uh, I want to start with Burundi, and then we can widen into the region. You're absolutely right. The Constitutional Court said, yes, this is it. What is different here, what is of interest, is that the, the president himself understood both the Arusha Accord and the Constitution in terms that the opposition is saying, namely two terms regardless of how you were elected. Why do I say that? Is that his first move was an attempt to change the Constitution, right? Mm -hmm. And when that failed, he resorted into reinterpreting it. So. If you if Re the, reinterpreting it in a manner that uh, is friendly to to his him, interest. yes, yes. If if he strongly believed in the first instant that both the Constitution and the Arusha Accord mm. allowed him to run for a third term, mm. why did he try to change the Constitution that was favorable? You see, my my. The, the, I, I, the, I, I see. You know, I see your reasoning, so, but of course. As you know, uh, he, com he continues to insist that the first term was not, elec was not an election, it was a selection. But, but that's after the attempt to change the Constitution failed that he drummed up this idea. You know, I wish honestly that uh, we had succeeded, for example, in getting his uh, uh, senior advisor on yeah. media affairs, yeah. Wire Nyamitwe. Mm -hmm. who was uh, really slated to join us, but unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, yeah. we could not uh, link up with him in Bujumbura. So I really have to apologize for that, because mm -hmm. at least the government it, itself would it, have had uh, its, uh, its perspective. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, so uh, beyond that, what is really some of the tweets that come in, some of the comments from right, uh, right. Wajen, is what is striking, I'm saying to myself, why does anybody, okay, let's put it this way, anybody who thinks that he or she is the savior of a people needs his head or head examined, you know? <laughs> but then I think people or leaders or rulers feel like that because we actually make them feel that way. You should see people uh, standing around a president Mm -hmm. Any president, for that matter, mm -hmm. how they behave. If you were that president, mm -hmm. frankly, or you were that queen, that king, that emperor, you would probably indeed feel that you are special. You are unique. You are yeah. superhuman. You know, well, special, unique, yes, superhuman, absolutely not. <laughs> but, you know, the point is that, you know, uh, uh, somebody who thinks right would understand that leadership is for service. If somebody does not understand that he or she has no place in leadership. Then how come you have no servant leaders almost across the entire continent? I don't know whether, let's say in Central Africa, that region itself, whether there is something about the food or water people drink there. <laughs> because you look around the neighboring countries, you know, <laughs> whether it be uh, Rwanda, uh, Uganda, uh, Uncle Mugabe there, or uh, DRC, people perpetuating themselves over and over. So Well, unfortunately, there's no democracy in 52. When you are ordered to go back, you have to go back. <laughs> Mariama, do you have any more feedback? 
share with our audience, please. Well, I'm still laughing at the, <laughs> the statement about there might be something in the food. Uh, we might be looking into that. It's well, very, very interesting. Because it is not Senegal. Huh? <laughs> it's not Senegal. You know, our food was good when our president, one of our presidents, uh, decided he wanted to tamper with the Constitution. What happened? People voted him out. And I think... That should be the norm, whether they tamper with the Constitution or not. At the end of the day, you have the power, basically, of voting and voting something in or out. So people should uh, think about that and maybe come to Senegal and have some more food. So that might work. Anyways, we're going to move on uh, to a posting from uh, Echegem uh, Okia of Gulu in the DRC, who writes, Greed for power, that's why Nkurunziza is going to abuse the Constitution at the age of 51. The guy is young and energetic compared to many African leaders who are at the twilight of their career and are still clamoring for more years in power. Well, while we're at it, let's take a look at another Facebook comment, uh, this time from Kwasi uh, Aka uh, from Benin City in Ghana, who says... President Nkurunziza should, uh, could uh, set a wonderful precedent that future generations could be proud of. But he has chosen to sacrifice all that because of his selfishness. Shaka, again, your take on this. Interesting. Uh, John, it's your call. Well, I, I, I would uh, take on the offer to come to West Africa to get some of the food. <laughs> hey, but wait a minute. Uh, don't you just buy into that? The last time I checked, do you know how many coups <laughs> these ogres pulled out in Nigeria? Mm -hmm. This is the first time they just got an election since right. October 1st, 1960, when they regained their political independence from the British. Yes. They just got the first election yes. in March. But again... Uh, so <laughs> they're, they're on the right track. <laughs> that's, that's, that's good. But uh, to, to be uh, on the serious matters of these things, Burundi is actually setting a trend here. Uh, after what happened in Burkina Faso, mm -hmm. Burundians are saying no to this type of uh, uh, leadership. And the young people who grew up under this Arusha, they call them Arusha generation because this is called Arusha movement. Uh, they believe in a better governance. They believe in a leadership that, in, that can uh, um, uh, provide, is responsive to them, their needs. Some of these young kids have graduated from school. They've never had a chance to get a job, employment. Right. So you see that the, the, the people of Burundi are saying, we, are, we know our rights and we are going to fight for our rights. And that's what's happening in Burundi. Talking about uh, the changing demographics, what is the percentage of the young, the youth in Burundi? I think it's in the, in the border of 65% of the, the people are under 35. Very interesting. So Very that's, interesting. A, that's a young, uh, as it's a reflective of Africa. Very interesting. Yes. Well, thanks, Mariema, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that will do it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please, please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at VOA, at AfricaTV at VOANews.com. Once again, our email address is AfricaTV at VOANews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at VOAAfrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, all eyes will be on Nigeria, as over 50 presidents and head of governments from across the globe attend the inauguration of President-elect Muhammadu Buhari on May 29th. We'll examine how the change of leadership will impact the future of Africa's most populous nation and largest economy. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. This country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away.
Once again, let's take a quick look at a timeline of Burundi's political instability. On April 17th of this year, Burundian police fired tear gas and water cannons at hundreds of protesters opposed to Nkurunziza's bid for a third term. On April 25th, President Nkurunziza officially announces his candidacy for the June presidential elections and he expels the ruling party members who were opposed to his third term run. On April 26, mass protests organized by civil society and some opposition parties turned violent. The military is deployed and at least six protesters are killed. On April 28, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon condemns the violence. On May 4, the Burundi's Constitutional Court rules in favor of President Kurunziza's decision to run for a third term. On May 19, President Kurunziza delays parliamentary and local elections until June 5, following protests and a failed coup attempt. On May 23, the leader of the UPD opposition party, Zedi Ferruzi, and his bodyguards were killed in a drive-by shooting in Bujumbura. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237 USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizuyu Iwat. Let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, Oble from Zambia. You are most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Shaka. How are you? I am hugely terrific, Oble. It's been a very, very long time. Where have you been, man? Indeed, it has been some time, Shaka. I've just been following the show, which is very, very interesting today's topic on Burundi. It's only that I'm very, very disappointed to note that in Kuruziza, who is our generational age, can he is tending to malign the constitution of the republic. Here in Zambia, I remember very well some years back, we we did never even ask the military. The people of Zambia stopped Dr. Chiruba for going for a third term. And I think even the people of Burundi, who, according to the statistics, are there about 55 percent are youth, they can manage to stop Nkuruziza from going to a third term because it's a very progressive idea of trying to keep a leader who is thinking has reached its apex. Thank you. Because I do not think Nkuruziza may even see beyond his nose of what he may bring in Burundi. Thank you very much, Oble, because there are lots of people. The traffic is heavy. Thank you so much, really, for your contribution. Let's go to Stephen from Tanzania. Good evening, Stephen. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Yes. Good evening, I'm Stephen. Yes, good evening, sir. Yes, how are you both? The, 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 the Nugu is fine, but could you do us a favor? It looks like uh, we are getting echoes on the line. Could you uh, lower the volume on your television or radio set, please? Okay. Uh, Hello? Hello. Uh, good evening to Gume from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. To Gume, can you hear me? I'm uh, very loud and clear. Yes, you sound like uh, a kid from Kavali. Are you from Kavali? 
No, I'm from the Switzerland of Africa, Fort Porto. Fort Porto, a beautiful place, beautiful place. I'm talking about yeah. the mountains of the moon, of course. Yeah, it's the Alps of Africa. Very interesting. What is your question to Gumi? My question is, have we as Africans ever thought about the way we make our constitution? Mm -hmm. Are they suitable for the political environment of African countries? Mm -hmm. For example, you guys have been laboring with the gentlemen in the studio there to explain to them that if they went legally in terms of constitutional interpretation, mm -hmm. they can prove that is right. Mm -hmm. If they could interpret the constitution as it was made, he is right. This is not his third time, it is his second time. Mm -hmm. But the trouble I am finding is that we Africans do not pay close attention when we are making these instruments. Thank you. And then they come to buy that group. Now, my comment is why should we have elections every five years in Africa? Is it a good practice for African countries? One, mm -hmm. they are very expensive. Every time we have them, it is a, 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 a recipe for violence and eating and what. I suggest that we should start making constitutions that are tailor-made for the African environment and country. I give a simple example. In Uganda, we are having elections every five years. It costs over 400 billion cities to run an election in this country. We don't have drugs in hospitals, and even the leaders, in five years, they cannot execute their manifesto. So that is why people keep rambling all time, rambling and rambling it after time. Thank you, very, thank you very much. Unfortunately, the phone is static and it's very difficult, frankly, to uh, glean what you are saying. But I think I sort of get a general sense. The gentleman is of the view, first of all, frankly, that perhaps uh, these elections uh, perhaps uh, are unnecessary, especially, I might add, if in fact they are not uh, elections that reflect the will of the people. These are elections or selections, frankly, which are put in place by people in power, not for the primary stakeholders, not for their own people, but for the so-called development partners. Mm -hmm. So these are not really elections. And so if they are not elections sincerely, that reflect the will of the people, why should we continue talking about we hold, quote-unquote, periodic elections? Yeah. Why not, in fact, put in place hospitals provide education for people, and what have you? Uh, you know, I, I couldn't agree with that more, you know, because, you see, governance and uh, democracy is not just about election. Election is just one tiny aspect of it, right. you know? Right, It's about involving people. Right. It's about getting the stakeholders only having ownership to in have the, a, say. a say in what's going but on. But in, in how the case government. of most of you African know? countries, frankly, the stakeholders are the development partners. Yeah, you know, you are, you are right. But the point is that, is, that is why we need young people, the next generation, to really examine what is going on here. And let me put uh, something here. You know, uh, in, in 2013, uh, African bishops, all of them, Catholic bishops, meeting, wrote this uh, interesting uh, publication. Right. Uh, governance, the common good, and democratic transitions in Africa. And in that, one of the things they said is that you know, it, the democracy is not about election. It's about people. It's about involving people. It's about people, stakeholders feel, feeling ownership. And they even make a bold suggestion that African countries should take a closer look at the forms of government they have mm -hmm. to see if that is really beneficial to the people. Yeah, but you know, dictators, of course, uh, what they say is that what is important is not democracy, but service delivery as if, in fact, the two were mutually exclusive. They are not. They are mutually reinforcing. In fact, talking about the Catholic Church, there is a story about a former French president, Jacques Chirac, mm -hmm. who once warned the Zimbabwean president, Robert Gabriel Mugabe, that, you know what, be careful about alienating two institutions, the Catholic Church and the media. If you alienate those two, you are in trouble. It looks like when you look at this, that appearing colonies in Bujumbura may in fact uh, have not about this, because he seems to have effectively alienated the Catholic Church in Burundi 
and of course the non-state controlled media is that correct but you people you are going around you are not looking at the region you are not looking at uganda for example mm -hmm. where a president yoweri museveni shifted the constitutional political goal posts back in 2005 when nkurunziza was going to state house bujumbura a man who came to power in 1986 and identified the problems of africa that it was not the african people but african leaders who overstay in power the last time i checked he's been there for almost 30 years and he still wants to run next year so what does the what has the international community done really they have essentially focused on Mr. Nkurunziza like a laser beam. But what about Museveni there? What about Kagame in neighboring Rwanda? He has been there for so long, and they are now having petitions, which from some of the evidence we are getting, actually is being gotten through intimidation because they have this system of Mayumba Kumi, 10 houses. Each house has a person to take care of that. You must sign. If you don't sign, you're in trouble. Well, I mean, to come back to the case of Burundi, and I, I would just uh, uh, respond a little bit to our brother in Uganda who talked about why don't we just not do elections because they're expensive, they are, they are inefficient, they, it's a waste of money. But you know what? Democracy is the, uh, the, the least uh, bad of the systems. Otherwise, you go back to uh, 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 king uh, monarchies where people just bo are born into power mm. and they run the whole country as their own property. Democracy is a way of selecting these representatives. Right. And in Burundi, the case of Burundi, it went through a war, 13 years of war, to the point where they decide from now on, let's agree. Almost on every a country in that region, mm -hmm. frankly, with mm -hmm. the exception of Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even in Kenya during colonialism, you had the Mau Mau, Muzunga, Kirudi, Ulaya, Mwafrika, Tapata, Uhuru. Mm -hmm. Every country in that region had go, has gone under that. Mm -hmm. But this the is a political they, development The problem are the people themselves. Democracy is not something that a government is going to hand to you on a silver platter. Now, you must take, you now, must demand and take. Now, the people of Burundi are standing up and asking for it. So the international community shouldn't condemn them saying because around you no, everybody no, 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 is no 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 they should not be selective well they should yeah. use a standard that is a reflection of their values once yeah. again which is democracy once no, again democracy cannot be good for this person and not good for the other person once again the, the international community comes in when the people are asking because burundi has been ignored for so long but it's I, only now that the international community is paying attention you have 30 seconds yeah, yeah but i also think that you know, something you mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the international community might pick, uh, not might, uh, very often pick up guys who are doing their bidding. And when they are not doing something right, they look the other way. The Swahili have a word mm -hmm. called Nyampara, mm -hmm. like a supervisor, a foreman of natives, so that they can pretty much promote the interests of the master. And, and that is going on around the region. Maybe. Well, on that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Reverend Aniedi Okule, Executive Director of the Africa Faith and Justice Network, and John Manirakiza, a member of the Burundian Diaspora in Washington, D.C. Thanks to affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's a daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not bitter Africa. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive.